Good evening. We're in Romans 10, and we're going to be looking at 11 and thir through 13. For the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek, for the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Lord, we thank you for tonight. We thank you for everybody being here. We ask a blessing upon them, Lord. May your peace be with them. May your spirit teach them what they need to know for themselves. May you minister to them personally and encourage them in their walk with you. And so, Lord, we thank you for everything. And we just ask that you just come down in a powerful way and meet each of us. And we just say this in your name. Amen. We've been considering what it means to call upon the name of the Lord. And the problem we have today is this uh, idea that you just accept Jesus and you're saved. Uh, the Bible, when you, when you look up word accept, it's more of an intellectual concept rather than a, a spiritual receiving. And so when you call upon something you are calling up on that situation because you're desperate. I don't hear people calling upon the name of the Lord unless they're desperate, unless there's a real need there. And so what that is showing you is you have to have a real need to call upon the Lord. You have to understand what your problem is, what the challenge is, what the situation is. And of course, a lot of people don't understand what it means to be saved. They're not saved in sin, they're saved from sin. And a lot of people are acting like they're saved in sin. That God's going to overlook their sin, and that's fine. But the reason that you call upon the name of the Lord is because you have a sin problem. There's an unresolved issue in your life, and only God can solve it. And when it comes to salvation, only the Lord can solve that issue. When it comes to sin, only God can resolve that issue. When it comes to your well-being, only God can resolve that issue. And so when we get into this aspect of calling upon his name, there's a lot of implications in that. One is that you will never be ashamed because once you put all your confidence in the Lord, you have that faith, in the end you'll never be ashamed. You'll never be upset, you'll never be disappointed. Because everything he's promised you, he's going to bring it about. But you have to hold on to those promises. You have to continue to call up and trust him. You have to rest everything on him. And it's easy to talk about, oh, I trust the Lord. I'm sure you've heard people say that. I trust the Lord. But when it comes down to the real um, test, they don't trust him. And what you see a lot of times is people say, I trust the Lord when it comes to my salvation. But I don't trust the Lord when it comes to my daily life. Mm -hmm. And making that decision. And yet that is where the real dependency comes on. In uh, You've heard a saying, don't put all your eggs in the basket. But with the Lord, you need to put all your eggs in the basket. One basket, Him. And everything that He's done for you. You can trust Him. Now, we talked about the term Lord, uh, of course, to the, to the Jews. That immediately said that he had authority. But it also set forth his label that he had authority to the Gentiles. And Paul's really laying it out. When you call upon his name, you understand who you're calling upon. He has the authority. He has the power to save you. And that's the key, to forgive you. He has all that. And, of course, when you come to the idea of the Lord, that means he's our owner. He's our possessor of all. He's your owner, guys. You don't call the shots. He calls the shots. He is Lord of all. And to confess is to declare what is true. That's what confession is. Yes, he is Lord. He is owner of all. He does possess all. He is the one I'm accountable to. And so... That confession is a legal binding uh, 
verbal agreement that you have entered into this covenant with God, this agreement with God that Jesus is Lord. And so you can get into a lot of aspects of that, but it's all a matter of faith. You receive it in your heart as being so. Now, Jews and Greeks are saved the same way. Everybody is going to be saved in the same way through Christ. They're not going to be saved because they're Jew. They're not going to be saved because they're Gentile. They're not going to be saved because they belong to a certain organization or religious group. They're going to be saved because Jesus Christ has been acknowledged as the only Lord and Savior of their life. Now, one of the things that always amaze me is people say, you just need to confess Jesus as your Lord and Savior. And I think, do they really understand what that means? Because you have to realize as Savior, he died. As Lord, he rose again. And so you're talking about a risen Savior, one who owns you. And so when we say, I have received the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, we are acknowledging that he is a risen Lord and that he's also the Savior. And so when we get into all that, we look at Jesus' name, which means Jehovah is our salvation, or Jehovah saves. And so basically his name, Jesus, points to his mission to save us. And it's that simple. In the Old Testament, they had Joshua in the wilderness. And in the New Testament, we have Jesus who leads us out of the wilderness and into all the promises of God. So there's a lot of things that are going on here. Now, it's important to understand uh, faith is the only way you can possess the promises. And why? Because you walk by faith. You don't walk by what you understand or what you see. You walk by faith in what? Towards God, towards who he is, towards what he's done for you. What has he done for you? Well, he died and saved me. Do you really know that? Well, yeah. Who is he? Why is he capable of saving you? It's because of who he is he's capable of saving you. If you don't have that understanding, you're really not going to trust what he's really done for you. Because you are basing everything not on his work, but on who he is. Because it's who he is that keeps the word, not because of what he can do. And so a lot of people are not placing their confidence on the person of God. They're placing their confidence on the work of God. And granted, the work of God is redemption, but God could have not brought it about. He wouldn't have meant what he said if he was not who he was and is. And so we have to keep that very clear. That's why if you call up on, you're going to rest everything upon who? The Lord Jesus, the one who saves. He owns you. Now, if you are walking by feelings instead of faith, you're walking by ideas or conclusions or images, you will end up being disappointed. The problem is when people walk according to their own notions about God is that when he fails them, he doesn't. But in their mind, he's not doing what he's supposed to do. When he fails them, they blame God instead of themselves. You know what? God doesn't give us expectations that are not true. Our expectation is based on him and having his will done. And that our hope is that expectation of him uh, working out his will in our lives. But a lot of people get angry at God because he's not bowing down to what they think. And it's his fault. They're blaming God. And it has nothing to do with God. It's because they have erected God to their own liking and God, the God of their liking has failed them because it's not truly God. And so you have to come back to who God is. And that's a big part of what Paul's trying to get through to people in Romans chapter 10. Now, we all know, we talked about how people in the Old Testament called upon the name of the Lord, such as Abraham and Isaac. And we sit there and think about it. 
we take so much for granted, but what a precious name he has. It's a name that will cause all to bow before him and to confess, guess what, that he is Lord. Now that's something that we already believe. Now I love it, we sing the song, He is Lord. We sing that song all the time. I don't know about you, sometimes at night we whisper his name to calm the soul and sometimes to revive the spirit. We lift up his name in praise and worship. We know his name. We know that it causes heaven to bow. We know that it means that in the end that that new life, that resurrected power of that new life is going to be raised up in us because of who he is. We know his name and because we've called upon his name. If you're saved today, you have called upon his name. The name of the Lord and because you have called upon his name, you are saved. Now, in the Bible, it's, you shall be saved. That can be optional. If you don't do it, it's not going to happen. Now, you can't get to heaven without calling upon the Lord of all. You can't get to heaven. You can't get to heaven without the King of heaven, the Judge of earth, and the Savior of the world. You can't get there without calling on the Lord. Because he's all those things and he's so much more. However, Paul is about to present an important case when it comes to evangelizing the Jews, and it's true for the Gentiles. He will bring out four points, and they're very important points, when it comes to sharing the gospel. Now remember, if one truly calls up on the name of the Lord, they shall be saved. So what Paul is about to do is present something to you that a lot of times people never go past 13 to see. But we're going to see it because we're looking at every scripture in Romans. So let's look at what 14 says because he's going to bring out four points when we get done about this. It says, How then... Shall they call upon him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him in whom they have not heard? And how, the, how shall they hear without a preacher? Now we'll stop there and look at those points. Paul's talking about evangelizing the Jew. But this goes for the Gentile, too. They have to be evangelized. He says, okay, you're supposed to call upon the name of the Lord and you shall be saved. But here's the problem. How can you call upon somebody whom you do not believe in the first place? How can you call upon Jesus if you don't believe him? If you have not believed what Scripture says, how can you call upon him? Now, why don't people call upon the Lord? Well, the big ones, they don't believe. But there's another problem. What have they heard about the Lord? What do they know about the Lord? What have you told people about your Lord? Because Paul's going to hit that point. Because before they can respond, they have to hear about the Lord. They have to have some idea about him. Not just what he did, but who he is. Because you're basing all of your salvation on who he is, not what he's done. And so that's why he says, how shall they, how shall they call upon him whom they have not believed? And then he goes, and how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? 
How can they believe in someone they haven't heard about? They don't know anything about. They don't care about. In fact, if you mention, they shrug their shoulders and say, okay, whatever. How can they believe something, trust someone they don't even know with their salvation, with their life, if they haven't heard about him? You see, you have to share that with people. That is our call and commission, to share the reality of Christ with people. Paul is laying this out very, very clear. It's, evangelis it's evangelization at its peak, at our responsibility. He's trying to really get, a, get us to get a hold of it. And then he goes, and how shall they hear without a preacher? What is a preacher? You're a preacher. I'm a preacher. Anyone who can share, proclaim the gospel is a preacher. It doesn't matter Gentile, Jew, gender, bond, free. We're all preachers. Because preachers proclaim something. They share something. And so this idea that the preacher only stands in the church is a bunch of baloney. Because that isn't what Paul is saying here. We're all preachers. Who we all have the same commission, what? To share the gospel. Every time you open your mouth, you're a preacher when it comes to the gospel. Every time you share the gospel, you're a preacher. We have done great disservice by presenting a preacher over here instead of saying you're all a preacher. If there's any point that you have shared the, uh, the gospel, you have been at that point a preacher. You have proclaimed it. You have declared it. You see, we preach the gospel because preaching is to wake people up. You have to remember that. The gospel is meant to wake people up. You can't wake people up when you're teaching them because you're teaching them according to their mind. They say if you teach, you're reaching the mind. But if you're preaching, you're trying to reach the soul. You're trying to penetrate that soul and wake them up to where they're standing, where they're at. I remember when I was uh, in Napa, and I taught, and I sort of preached to them. And some of it was pretty tough. But I just saw they were so, uh, even great preaching puts people to sleep. Hear what I'm saying. Great preaching can put people to sleep because they begin to take it for granted. They're not being stirred. That's why we had evangelists. They were supposed to come and wake people up because it's so easy to go to sleep if you don't know how to stir yourself up. And so they're sitting there sort of nonchalant. And I said, I'm going to give you an example of what evangelism sounds like. And I preached an evangelistic message. You should have seen the look on their face. They were waking up. I thought I should preach more evangelistic messages. <laughs> you know, but they would have got used to that too. I hate to tell you, people get used to it. And sometimes they get on a pride trip. Well, you should hear our preacher. Boy, he's really good, yeah? What do he preach about? I don't know, but he's really good. <laughs> what was the message? Oh, I don't know, but it was a really good message. So how much did you sleep through that message? And so you always ask those people, I used to, every time, that's why I still do, after I would share the word, I'd say, what did you learn? What did you learn? You see, I wanted to know if they were understanding the message, number one, but I wanted to see if they were paying attention. And the kids got smart, the young people. They would listen for one thing they could write down, and then that's what they told me they learned. But that was one thing they learned. 
And so I like to ask people, what did you learn? Well, I know I learned something. I put people on the spot and they say, you know what, I learned all kinds of things. I have to think about real, give me a break. But I do that because I want to see if they're awake. That's my main goal. I want to see people awake. They hear what God's saying to them. But anyway, here we have this, and Paul is looking at it and says, how shall they hear without a preacher? You're all a preacher. You're all called to the same commission. What's that commission? Well, it's twofold. In Matthew, it's to disciple, make people followers of Christ. But in Mark 16, it's to preach the gospel. And God is going to send signs and wonders to confirm the message. Not you, but the message. The power of the gospel can save you. So it's only right to, you know, back it up with signs and wonders. We know that. Now, the, the reality is, is that for people to really hear, though, okay, and you have to realize that when we stand, we're standing on who Christ is. When we withstand, we're standing, withstanding because of what he did. And we continue to stand because of what he promised us. But you begin with who he is, the truth. And you have put all your faith in that. And so the whole purpose is to bring people to the place where they can stand withstand and continue to stand and to do that they have to begin knowing who their foundation and cornerstone is to do that we need to talk about who christ is we know that jesus made a very important statement to peter because you have to remember something the godhead is involved in salvation the father draws you to the son the Son invites you to himself, and the Holy Spirit convicts you of your need for the Son. They're all part of salvation. And, and that's why Jesus told Peter, he says, who do you say I am? Well, he first said, who do others say I am? And then he said, who do you say I am? And when Peter said the right answer, he says, no one revealed, to you, no one revealed that to you except the Father through the Holy Spirit. You see, I want you to know, you can intellectually know all kinds of things, but it's only when God reveals it to your spirit that it becomes truth to you. If it hasn't been revealed to your spirit, you can't stand on it. It's going to be dead letter to you. So here we come to this reality, is that you have to have an open heart to hear the eyes of faith to see beyond the world, hearing ears to hear what's being said by the Spirit, believe and receive it as truth. Do you want the truth, or do you want to hold on to your own reality, which basically holds on to foolish notions about God, religion, and etc.? We are God's mouthpiece, and we possess the life of Christ, the truth of his gospel, the testimony of salvation. That's what you need to possess as a Christian. And if you don't have it down, you need to get back and say, God, what's missing in my life? Because I'm the voice. I'm the hands. I'm the feet. I'm the extension of you. And I've been commissioned to do this. I've been called to do this. I've been given an opportunity to do it. And he says in verse 15, And how shall they preach except they be sent? Now that's a big one. How do they preach unless they be sent? I want you to know that, as I stated, our Great Commission doesn't belong to a few. It's not limited by any boundaries except by our own notions and fears and prejudice. We are all to proclaim. And you have to remember, it's so easy to invite someone to church so the pastor will preach the gospel, we hope. How many preachers are really preaching the gospel? You have to think about that. 
You know what makes the gospel real to somebody? When they look at your life and see you as a living epistle who's walking it out. And you've got something they want. That's what they're looking for. They're not looking for fluff, religious garbage. They're not looking for someone that's like them. They're looking for someone that can save them from themselves. They're lost, they're hurting, they're wounded. They're looking for something real. And we should be the living epistles of what's real. And it's all because of why? Because we have been sent. How many of you realize you've been sent? You see, the Father sent the Son. And the Son said to his disciples, I send you. What's the commission? I send you. What's your responsibility? Go. But you say, oh, well, I don't have a method down. One of the things I've listened to is people's methods. Man's methods to get people saved. You know, a lot of times it's just seducing them, getting them to say a prayer. I want you to know that if you're sent, there's no method. Man's the method. The Holy Spirit determines how he uses you. Man is God's method. And when man gets into his two cents and he tries to devise a method, he might get a few here and there, but basically most of them are going to get on a sentimental whatever trip or go through the sinner's prayer, and it's not going to mean a thing to them. You see, the Holy Spirit has to impact your life. And God enables us to be witnesses. To do what? To preach the gospel. He empowers us with the Holy Spirit. Now, how can I be used by God? Well, I have to say this to you. If you want to be used by God, you say, God, here I am. And I have to trust you, <laughs> who you bring into my midst. God, you are the one that prepares the, the vessels. You're the one that prepares the hearer. You're the one that prepares. You equipped, and you have sent me. But you're going to have to bring the people my way. Do not go to the bushes. Let God bring the people out of the bushes to you. But you have to avail yourself to that. You know, I love Jeanette. She's spontaneous about everything. She'll give a track out. She'll do this. She'll do that. I'm not that way. You know, I should say that about myself. I want to get to know somebody. I have a different way of evangelizing. And like I said, everybody has to come to terms with how they evangelize. It's all different. But people, you're the method, and God will show you the means. But you have to avail yourself to that. And so man needs to quit looking for methods and avail himself. Christians, God, here I am. If I can share Christ with somebody, and Lord, I can be a little stupid, so take a board and knock me over the head. Because I can be. I'm like clueless. Rayola, oh, yeah, hi, how you doing? You look sad, or whatever, you know? There's always a door to open. You will never understand. We want to see results. I want you to know you'll never hardly see results. Don't expect to see results. You're not the one bringing in the harvest. Forget it. You're the one that's out there working in the harvest, but you're not going to necessarily see the end results of it. You may hear about years later. And that's happened to me. I've had, you know, people call me up out of the blue or come up and say, you did, and I'm like, really? You know, you never know. You know why? Because God gets the glory, not you. If you could see everything you could do, you'd get a big head. Oh, look how brilliant I am. Yeah, you just get knocked off your pedestal and, you know, you just, stole God's glory. 
And I've always asked, Lord, don't let me touch your glory. And so he keeps me from knowing a whole lot. Praise God, because my conceit is big, and I don't want to know it. Because you know what? It's his business. It's his business. But consider what Paul is saying. How shall they preach except they be sent? He's asking a very good question here. We have to be sent. And Jesus sent forth his apostles. And we have to shod our feet. Knowing what? Well, it says in the last part of verse 15, as it is written, How beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. How beautiful are your feet. You know, in the, in the armor, you shod your feet with the, what? The gospel of peace. Now, of course, Paul is quoting in this Isaiah, if you want to look at 52.7, he actually is quoting that, because that's what Isaiah said. 52.7. have to excuse me, I did. But we're close. 52.7. It says, how beautiful... Upon the mountains are the feet of him that brings good tidings, that publish peace, that brings good tidings of good, that publish salvation, that saith unto Zion, thy God reigns. Wow. So Paul is in Ome making reference in Isaiah 52, 7, by the way. He's making reference to this scripture. He says, don't you understand, when you are preaching peace, he's talking about reconciliation between God and man, which comes through Christ. When you're preaching that, you're going to have peace. You're bringing something that's so beneficial to a person's soul and well-being. That is just awesome. And we don't even realize, as Christians, what we have so many times. We're like, oh. Saved, then that's enough. What about the person next to you? Are they saved? Have you availed yourself to ask them questions and, and to listen to them and find out where they're at in their spiritual life so you can bring in Jesus? You can bring in what He did for you. We're not looking for that, we're trying to send the people into the churches. And they're walking out, maybe religious, but they're not walking out saved. But people need that personal encounter of Christ, and they get that personal encounter through you. Not the preacher, through you. I remember that there were two ladies that was used to my salvation. And they, God used them mightily to bring me to Christ. They were cousins. Seven years after I was saved, I was stationed in the Navy at the time, Coronado. I went back to Coronado. I was visiting somebody back there. And I looked for them on the phone, through the phone book. We're talking about San Diego. I couldn't find either of their names. I knew one got married. So I called the parents, because the name was unusual, I called the parents of one, and I said, I'd like to talk to your daughter. And I told them sort of how I'd known her, and so they gave me her number. And I remember calling her. Of course, she was a little surprised hearing me seven years later. And I said, I want to thank you for being willing to be used of God. Because of you, I'm saved. She gave me the number of the other lady that called her and told her about the same thing. She says, you know what? And she was the most outspoken of the two. She says, I've sort of given up sharing the gospel. But she says, after talking to you, I need to start doing it again. You know, how important is that? They had the most beautiful feet to me because they led me to Christ. There's nothing more beautiful in the kingdom of God than you leading to someone to Christ. 
And the other part is a little bit more nerve-wracking. He's discipling them. Good luck on that one, right? But you got to get them to the water before you can hand them the water. And you have to understand that. And God does that if you avail yourself. The reason why m- many people, and we're, we're going to get into that here in verse 16, but they have not all obeyed the gospel. That's the tragedy. Not everybody is going to respond to the gospel. They can be very unresponsive. And so they're not all obeyed the gospel for Isaiah say, Lord, who has believed our report? Now, I want you to think about what he's saying here. This is, of course, going back to Isaiah. He's saying, who will believe our report? You see, the gospel is a report. It's a testimony. It's a record of what God has done. Who's going to believe it? Not everybody. Not everybody's going to be responding. But that's not your problem. That's God's problem. The Bible, they use the the terms all the time, you know, his word will not return vain, uh, void. That's true. But what people don't understand is God's word brings people to crossroads. And they'll either choose to believe or not. And basically, if they choose to believe that salvation, if they choose not to, then when they stand before God, God's going to say, remember, I brought somebody to you and you didn't believe. His word at that point becomes judgment. And there's no way they can falsely accuse God that no one, that they never heard. Please hear me. If God doesn't hear, he can use you. He's going to bring somebody else. But you missed a, ter- you missed a great blessing to be part of God's great move upon hearts and lives. We want to make a difference, you know. How do we want to make a difference? Well, a lot of us, oh, I want to leave my children this, I want to leave that. Let me tell you something. That's going to go. What is lasting is that spiritual investment you make into souls with the truth of Christ. That's what's lasting. That is the legacy. And I know that. You know, I'm not going to leave anything behind that's important except that testimony. And every time I get a chance, I share that testimony with people. Probably drive them crazy, but I share it with them when I'm given the opportunity to do so. Now, some don't appreciate it. Can you imagine that? But people are looking for what's real. And you have to realize that when people, they don't fall into hell necessarily because of all the bad things they've done. They trip over the man Jesus Christ, and fall into hell. They're a lot like Luke's 16 story. The rich man, he didn't fall into hell because he was a bad man. He tripped over Lazarus and found himself in hell. And you have to realize that man trip trips over Jesus. And he said, I will either break you or crush you. But there's no way around me. And that's what people have to understand. There's no way you're going to get around Jesus in this world without encountering him. When man trips over the gospel message, it's because he's tripping over that one man. His name is Jesus. And it comes down to the fact that man will not believe what Scripture de- declares about who Jesus is and what he's done on their behalf. You see, when you believe Christ, you know what you fall into? His great net of redemption. But if you don't believe him, the net's not there. And you fall into hell. You'll find yourself there. 
We have to remember that. Now here comes a big one, verse 17. So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. I want you to hear, I want you to really think about this scripture. We hear this all the time, but think about it. Why do you approach the Bible? To get your narrative, to agree with your narrative, to back you up in your uh, belief systems. Why do you approach the Bible? Now, it took me a while to understand this. Because I used to argue the Bible. I used to do all kinds of things. Oh, I'm so smart. Finally, when I hit the wall and God dealt with me, he finally exposed to me, Rayola, the only reason you approach the Bible is to believe it. Because it's God's word. You don't approach it to argue with it, to debate it, to see what fits, to uh, confirm your narrative. You approach it to believe it because it's either God's word or it's not. So why do you approach the Bible? Is it your religious duty? Oh, I'm getting my Bible reading for the day. Oh, you think God's impressed with that? Why do you read that Bible? It's for you, not God. Well, I'm going to church, and you think God sees that? You go to church for yourself. You're not to forsake the assembly. All this thing we think that God's impressed with, we're doing it for ourselves. Because that's what it takes to spiritually survive. You've got to be in fellowship. You've got to partake of the word. You've got to be in prayer. You've got to do these things because they edify you, because they give you an avenue in which to release. Or be part of something. You can't do anything for God. You can just present everything to God by presenting your body as a living sacrifice. That's what it comes down to. It says, so faith cometh by what? Hearing. Hearing what? The word of God. The word of God says, if you call upon the name of the Lord Jesus, you shall be saved. The word of God says, if you believe, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart he raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. That's what it says. It's not all this elaborate stuff we put out there. It's just believe. It's God's word. It's so, and I'm going to put everything in that belief. I'm going to rest on it. I'm going to walk according to it. That's what it's all about. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And people, if you don't hear it from the word, don't put faith in it. I don't care what pastor you hear it from. I don't care anything. If it doesn't come from the word, do not put faith in it. It's not going to do a thing for you. It's got to come from here. The word of God. But you've got to have the right attitude and the right approach. I approach this Bible not to argue, but to believe it. God says it's true. I'm going to believe it. I'm going to obey it. I'm going to walk in it. I'm going to walk by it. That's what it's about. So let's look at 18. He says, but I say, have they not heard? He says, have they not heard about Christ? Have they not heard about the gospel? There's a very few people that I've ever encountered said, I don't know about anything. But they still had to have to heard about God or the gospel somewhere. Even if it was cuss words. Even if it was mocking. They had to hear something about God or Jesus Christ along the way. Because guess what? He's a great controversial figure, even today. Who are they trying to pro uh, persecute? Christians. Why? Because we believe in Christ. He says, who hasn't heard? Who hasn't heard some aspect of the gospel, even if it's negative, who hasn't heard? He's asking that question. Do the Jews, have they heard about Jesus? Yeah, they've heard about it. 
They've heard about it. They've rejected it. They're angry at it. They're suspicious of it. They, per, uh, they persecute missionaries that go over there and try to evangelize the Jews. You hear the stories. They don't keep you from believing what you believe, but you don't go out there and preach it to anybody. It's against the law. Did you know that? And so anyway, who hasn't heard some aspect about the gospel? about what Jesus did. Look at what it says in 18. Yes, verily, their sound went into all the earth and their words unto the end of the world. He says the gospel, through all these voices, through these witnesses, have gone throughout the whole earth. And we know that the end won't come until the gospel reaches every last sinner or heir of salvation. He's right. That's what it says. Have they not heard it? But you know what? They haven't believed it. They choose not to believe it. That's their problem. The Jews and Gentiles have heard it. So look at what 19 says. It says, but I say, did not Israel know? Did they know about the promises of their Messiah, and that people declared Jesus was their Messiah, did they not know that? He says, first, Moses says, I will provoke you to jealousy by them that are no people, and by a foolish nation I will anger you. Who's he talking about? Moses talking about the Gentiles. Because the people of Israel, the nation of Israel, did not receive their Messiah, he says, I'm going to provoke you to jealousy by using people you think are foolish by nations that have no clue about me. He's talking about Gentiles. Why would he provoke us to jealous? Provoke them to jealousy? Because then they would see we're, guess what? Receiving blessings and promises. They're missing out on it's all because of the Messiah. You see, this has all been prophesied. This has all been prophesied. This is, there's nothing new as to what's happening. And so when you look at it, remember what John 1 says. Let's look at that in John 1. I take you here because this is the problem with it, the nation of Israel. Not every Jew. We know some Jews receive Christ. But the nation itself, this is their problem. We're looking at verses 10 and 11. He says, he was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He came unto his own, the Jewish people, and his own received him not. That's how it worked. He's talking about the nation, not every, every Jew, okay? Because we know some Jews have come to Christ. Now, they would try to actually, and when you look at the Jews, they would try to silence him with death. But guess what? He rose again, leaving an incredible witness behind him. He rose again. That's why it says that you believe in your heart that God has raised Jesus. You believe that. Because upon his resurrection is all the promises of eternal life founded on and the victory over death. So, let's look at 19, uh, 19 and 20 and where that comes from is Isaiah 65.1 speaks of this group of people that God uses meaning the Gentiles. Remember, we're considered dogs beneath them. Isaiah 65, 1. Because he's going to get into this a little bit more when you get into chapter 11, so you have to really sort of get a hold of this. 65, 1. He says, I am sought of them that ask not for me. He's talking about Gentiles. 
They weren't seeking him. I am found of them that sought me not. Again, he's found by those that were not seeking him necessarily. Behold me, behold me unto a nation that was not called by my name. Again, he's talking about Gentiles. This was all prophesied uh, by in the Old Testament. So why try to bring or move them to jealousy? That's what he's doing. He's trying to use you and I, Gentiles, us dogs, us individuals, to move them to jealousy. And why? Well, look at verse 21. But to Israel, he says, all day long I've stretched forth my hands unto a disobedient and gainsaying people. He says, even though you've rejected me, and I'm going after this other nation, these other people, because you're rebellious, I still stretch my hand before you to reach you. And you still continue to be rebellious. He's still stretching his hand towards Israel today. They're still being rebellious. They're still rejecting the truth that he's their Messiah. But you have to think about this for a minute, okay? Here we have Gentiles who did not know God seeking him out. But for many of the nation of Israel, for many in the nation of Israel, they have remained unresponsive towards their Messiah. That's the key. You cannot be unresponsive towards Jesus. But in spite of it, how he has constantly stretched forth God, his hand, even to them in their disobedience. Now we can look at the foolishness of Israel's unbelief, but we must keep in mind something. We have all heard some aspect of the gospel. Maybe every one of you should have heard all of it here. And how we have responded to it is the real key. It is not just a matter that you simply heard it. What counts is do you believe the account that God has set forth in his word about Jesus? Have you really believed that account? Have you believed it is so that he is everything the Bible says he is? That you have received it as being so in your heart. And the reason we do this is if the Jews, who should have known better, missed it all. They missed it all. They had prophecies. They had everything. How easy will it be for the Gentiles to miss it too? Because of their philosophies, their idols, their beliefs, their self-sufficiency and arrogance. People... It's easy for us to miss it too. And so we need to be prepared to be that preacher, that vessel, and say, Lord, here I am. I may not have my testimony down pat, but Lord, you can bring the person to me that I still can share what testimony I have with them. I'm here, I'm available. Have your way. And so I want to encourage you to do that because Paul's right. How can you expect them to call upon someone they don't even know? Really know. How can you expect them to listen to you about someone that they don't even care about? And it's the Holy Spirit that can make that happen But he wants to use you and I to cause that person to respond to the Father's drawing, to the Son's invitation, and to to the Holy Spirit's reproof of sin. 